Welcome to Living Legacy Leadership, where we'll explore, discover, and share insights, tools, and strategies for a life well lived into an elderhood. I'm your host, Donna Kim Brand, author, speaker, legacy strategy coach, and creator of the concept Living Legacy, where you choose to live life on your own terms while contributing to people, places, and projects along your life journey. It's my belief that the life you live is the legacy you leave. Now, the guests I bring to you each week all address some unique aspect of learning, leadership, or legacy. This helps you raise your own game as a leader in business and life, and also showcase to some extraordinary people who exemplify living legacy leadership. At least once a month, I also offer a training session to skill you in game-changer thinking for your own application. So get your notebook ready or sharpen up your memory by tuning in your attention, and we'll dive right in. Now, to kick off our Boomer Beacon series, let me introduce you to an an unconventional improv showman and military veteran, Jim Jackson Menard, who unfurled a career path by following his interests and gut instincts. He was an acclaimed radio and TV journalist and newscaster all across the U.S., creating a cult of personality before it was the way media is presented now. Um, Since Jim will reveal his career path and lessons learned in our discussion here, I don't want to give away too many details right here. Let me just bring him on board. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. Delighted to have you here today across the airwaves um, and chat about your very interesting life that's still going full steam. (laughs) Yeah, I I think it's interesting anyway. Yeah, for sure, for sure. (laughs) So yeah, tell us a little bit about how the place and the way you grew up influenced the, the early career that you stepped into. Oh, my. Well, I guess I'm just like everybody else. Um, uh, when you're nurtured in a place, uh, it becomes very much a part of your existence long after you leave it. Uh, I was always I'm always going to be a Midwestern guy. Uh, growing up near Cleveland, I was terribly interested in music and electronics of any kind. In those days, electronics, I say, oh, those days, like I'm, I'm an ancient guy. But <laughs> growing up in the, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, was, uh, I'd say it, I, you could call it a, a small explosion of technology. But I knew this from a very early age. It was something I was interested in. And even though no one in my immediate family, no cousins, uh, no, you know, uncles, no one was in show business. I was an inveterate performer. I just didn't know that that's what I was supposed to do. <laughs> and I, 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 you know, because nobody else around me did it for a living. Nobody acted for a living or nobody uh, was that I knew was in radio for a living. I went to a uh, I was a musician, and I was in a Dixieland band, and uh, I, uh, we were chosen uh, to appear on a radio program in my local hometown. A place is called WHHH AM Radio, and uh, we went up there to be there to perform in their studios, and I was in awe. Uh, glass-lined rooms with microphones and tape recorders. I thought, this is very cool. But again... I really realized that real people did this for a living. I just enjoyed it. And I think that's the secret to happiness is if you find something you enjoy. So I, I did then and then uh, and, and did other little things. When I was a kid, you know, there were Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and maybe there still are today. I just don't pay attention. But uh, while other Boy Scouts were getting canoeing merit badges and archery, I got a journalism merit badge. All right. Then, yeah, it was it was a strange request. I found it in the Boy Scout handbook, a very thick book, a little paperback they give kids. And in there is a list of all the merit badges. And it said journalism. And, and it said you had to earn a merit badge by getting a newspaper article printed. And I thought, now that would be cool. So I went to uh, the Youngstown Vindicator and, and, and up to the front desk there, had my mother take me up there. I was nine, I think. And uh, I said, I got to write a story uh, for the newspaper. And I said, I'm going to take you to the city desk. 
and he took me to the city desk. And this was a crowded, cramped, gray room that had uh, lights very similar to pool table lights back in those days. Mm. And they sat over all these desks, and these guys in white shirts with their sleeves rolled up and their hands full of ink were hammering away at uh, typewriters and on the phone, and they're all smoking cigars. And I said, this is the life I want to live. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, amazing. Taking an interest. Yeah. I'll tell you the truth, though. I did that stuff as an amateur, learned those things, went to those places, and then I went in the Army and never really thought about what I had done as a career. Mm. And uh, that is a piece of advice that I have to give. Right. If you, nobody around you may be doing what you're interested in. Do not let that make you think it's not real. Right. Yeah, for, for sure. And, you know, you you talked about early on in your life being a bit of a showman. Did, did that include being a class clown? Absolutely. It did. And yeah, do you, you think can ask my of, wife. Oh, <laughs> did that yeah. grease the wheels for your, your eventual stand-up comic? Um, uh, well, was that was part of it? I, 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 did, I did stand-up comedy uh, at church functions. It's the only place if I got up and did something, somebody would, you know, they wouldn't laugh at me. Uh, but I just had the urge to perform, and I was a big fan of Bob Newhart. Oh, and so I would right. memorize Bob Newhart's comic routines from his records. And uh, I would do, I would spit them back out at, at uh, church functions. Like I was some kind of comedian. Of course, I wasn't. Yeah, that was early performing. I just needed to perform. Hmm. So then you, it sounds like you had an entree into both radio media and print journalism. So how did you decide which direction to take that, those interests? Uh, you know, it was all, it was all about gravity. Mm. Uh, just following, following the flow downstream. I was in school, uh, in college, Kent State University, and um, I was doing a lot of things there and performing. I was majoring in, in a theater. I was taking dance. I was, I, I, I was, uh, I created an improvisational free university at night and, uh, uh, we did plays there on the campus and, uh, at Kent State University. And I really didn't even, even though there was one there, you know, there was a broadcasting school there at Kent State, but I was in the theater hmm. and never saw a broadcasting school, never thought about it until a, a guy started coming to my improvisational class who was a disc jockey part-time at a radio station in Cleveland called WNCR-FM, first FM rock and roll station in, in the Midwest. And um, uh, he, uh, he and I talked, and they had a very creative news department at that radio station. Now, I had been writing drama criticisms, little plays, directing plays, but didn't have any real direction in my performing, acting here and there. But uh, he said, you might be interested in this. The news director is looking for a report. And he said, they don't, do, they don't do ordinary news. And I listened to their news. It was very creative and satirical and lots of fun. Uh, I had never done a video show in my life. Uh, so I just drove to sleep. And I went to the news director. And I, I said, look, uh, I, I've never done that stuff. But I've done this stuff. And he said, yeah, you've done some stuff. Well, we'll pay you $25 a story. <laughs> and by the end of the week, I've written so many stories, they had to hire me because they could afford to pay me $25 a story. So how <laughs> I got in radio, I'm not sure to this day, except that Norman Moore decided to check a guy who had been doing theater and let him do radio. Now, if there are a lot easier ways to start careers. One, you could get educated in them formally, in colleges, but I just, that's not the way my life worked. Hmm. And you, you mentioned about entering the military, and I didn't want to dismiss the, the very wise comment you made about valuing your life experiences, whether anybody else around you or not does. So what happened for you in the military, and did that further impact your career in the future? Well, uh, hmm. you know, I never really thought about how it's shaped my life otherwise uh, in terms of my career. It certainly you know, being in the military grows you, and it grew me up. Grew me up. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, it didn't really provide me any direction, 
but it did show me some terrible reality. And, you know, I, I went in a boy and came out a man. I'm not yeah. sure. It's funny, too, as I think about it, because I still did gravitate towards something like that. I was military policeman, and I was working in a, a place that now gets a lot more publicity called Pamun John in Korea. Oh, right. And I, I got to know a, a reporter there for Stars and Stripes. And we eventually did do some research together for some stories that he did for Stars and Stripes about the, the borderline battles between North and South Korea. Uh, so I ended up hanging out with a journalist, even though I wasn't one when I was in the service. So I guess in that respect, I just kept gravitating toward journalism and that sort of stuff. But no, I, aside from the fact that I, I became a grizzled cynic, <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not sure how I've changed my career. <laughs> right. And uh, as I recall, there was one story where the very fact you'd been a veteran opened a door for you. I'm sorry, I didn't I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes, I recall a story I heard from you once where having been a veteran, you were invited into a role when somebody else left a position. Simply oh, yes. well, it was that, first, that first gig in Cleveland and it, when I got, you know, when I fell into the radio business was actually because and not so much I don't think so much it was me uh, that the news director was interested in. It was that that same day, uh, his uh, reporter, his star reporter, uh, had decided that he was going to move to Canada. Uh, I don't know how much you know about those days in the 60s and early 70s, but there was a draft. And I think the draft is something that should be reinstituted because people cared a lot more about whether or not we were at war when their kids were being drafted. Mm. Uh, and I think in all professional army today is not what we should have. We should, everybody should put in two years of service because I think it makes you a better adult no matter what. But it also means people get more involved in the government when their kids are being handled by the U.S. government. Anyway, I, I, uh, I digress. There, uh, there was this draft, and at that point in time, in 1970, 69, if you got drafted, you were going to war. There was no question about it. And uh, so the reporter decided to move to Canada that day because he had a high draft number, a high draft lottery number. He was going to be drafted within 30 days. And he knew it because the, the, the lottery gave everybody a number. And I didn't have to worry about the number because I had already been to the service. Right. So the news director was sitting there. He's got a guy who's leaving to protest the war and go to Canada. And on that same day, in wants the guy who's already been to war, so he doesn't have to worry about that part of it. <laughs> but it was a result of the fate of this country that helped my career. It really hmm. did. I, I, the guy was going to war, and I wasn't. Right. That was that. Wow. Wow. So, Jim, you know, getting into journalism, I in my introduction, I it was my verbiage, not yours, about the cult of personality, because... I know what a dynamic personality you are. Um, and that, of course, is now how the morning shows like Good Morning America and the other channels uh, portray their their newscasters and so on. It's as much entertainment as it is, um, or maybe even more so than news, um, you know, serious news anchoring and so on. So what are some Absolutely. of the trends, trends you've seen in developing in your initial field there of either journalism through newscasting or radio that either interest you or, or disappoint you maybe? Um, I was very lucky. I was very lucky because uh, I grew up uh, in an age when media was exploding. Uh, the, when I first started uh, in uh, radio broadcasting, there were two in Cleveland, the eighth largest city in the country at the time, there were two rock and roll radio stations. Now there are 15. Uh, when I started, uh, and not only that, there, there is satellite radio, there, there's, you know, there's the, the, a chance to get content to hear.